Uh, on behalf of the Borough of Cochranton and the Care Committee, welcome to Cochranton. For the next few hours, we want to help you turn back the clock to the 18th century. We wish to have you focus on the epic time in the French Creek Valley. The local Native Americans knew well when something extraordinary was happening. French Creek was alive with French troops moving south to secure their fortifications. There appeared to be a great sense of general unrest in the region, and it appears that life in the tranquil region was about to be altered for all times. The noted historian Stephen Ambrose relates that the most important part of history is the last five letters, S-T-O-R-Y, story. For this is the account of the past that is what it is about people and what they did, which is what makes it the most fascinating of subjects. We not only have a great story to share, we have a, a local tale of an epic event that will change the course of world history. Today we explore the first true world war. Your challenge will be to immerse yourself in the elements of the event. We have arranged a distinguished and noted panel of speakers that will share a variety of perspectives to help you understand the elements that defines the events that impacted this time period. You will need to visit the camps of our reenactors. Each of these living historians will help you better visualize and understand their part in the narrative. Arranged along the driveway are the suitlers who will display the wares of the time and in many instances show you how their trades were necessary to the basic survival needs of the time. Later each day the focus will shift to the tactical error of the field where the sights and sounds and smells of the century will come alive for you. Another must stop is the old depot where you will be greeted by several artists whose canvases capture, the, capture and depict the events and elements of our dramatic story. A better understanding of our early humans will be found in the museum quality artifacts that will be rediscovered, that we have rediscovered along the lands that border French Creek. These stone artifacts help define the type of life that led in the, floor, the floodplains of this valley. A hands-on event will highlight the work done by the modern archaeologist and their role in discovering and understanding the traces left behind by our ancient ancestor. This is an activity for all ages, so we always talk about it for the kids, but you guys are allowed to get in there and dig a little bit, too. A new feature of our event is an examination of the evolution of weapons that have been used by mankind to battle each other. This fascinating display of guns can be found at the gym at the high school, so you're going to need to cross over the footbridge and go over to the high school. You'll see the big sign there. A few surprises await you over the next two days. It appears that our favorite 21-year-old 20 year Virginian will be returning to greet guests and tell his early travels in the, along the French Creek Valley. So it appears that you have a lot to do. Remember, it's all about the story. Be bold. Ask questions. Get involved. This is a unique this is your unique opportunity to step back in time. So we're going to start out uh, with our first speaker this morning. And we'll dig up his barrel here. So our first speaker is going to be Mark Hersey, and he's an independent researcher and historian. Uh, his focus is on the 17th and 18th century Great Lakes history. He has published several articles dealing with diplomacy and commerce at Fort Niagara and Detroit during the Revolutionary period. Mark has also lectured at more than a dozen historic sites and museums. He holds a BA in history from the State University of New York College at Buffalo and earned his, his MA at Duquesne University. His topic today is Frontier Commerce in the 18th Century, a study of trade goods, routes, and transportation technology. Please welcome Mark Hersey. Thank you. Yeah, great to be here. It looks like a great event. Should be plenty to do, and hopefully we'll uh, keep everybody in interested and on the edge of your seat through all these uh, talks coming up. Um, so yeah, i am uh, been in involved in this uh, kind of uh, study of the uh, 17th, 18th century um, since my teenage years, growing up close to Fort Niagara, and you'll hear mo more about Fort Niagara throughout the rest of the day. And, uh, you know, it's been a, a great privilege to be able to volunteer there over the years and, and uh, continue to do so. It's a lot of fun. If you, you know, I, anybody in this community, there's other options for you. I see these great archeology span programs going on. Th those kind of uh, efforts need your support if you're in this community to, to capture and, and keep the, the history at the, the front of people's minds in these areas where significant things happen like this. So my, uh, my thing lately has been um, sort of the commerce and the diplomacy, as, as Mark said. So, you know, 
when, when you, you know, we often bookmark our periods of history, you know, in, in North America on the frontier by these conflicts, you know, the French and Indian War period, Revolutionary War period, 1812, you know, but through those periods and then those periods of relative peace in between, there's always a thread of, of uh, diplomacy, commerce, sort of an exchange of in, the, in the, the mix of cultures going on at places like Niagara where you have, you know, you've had the, uh, the French uh, presence, the British presence, the American presence, and of course all the neighboring Native American nations, particularly Seneca, and then uh, west of the Niagara River, Mississauga people. There's always these efforts at diplomacy, of being good neighbors. And, 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 and along with that is exchange. Exchange, of course, and you know, as, as we're probably is best known in the fur trade. And uh, there's also exchange of you know, knowledge, ideas, language, things like that, that, that characterize this, this, this mix, this uh, complex cultural um, entity or reality that, 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 that has to exist. Uh, for the French to, for instance, keep their presence at Niagara, or for the French to be able to establish themselves at Presqu'ile and, and come down French Creek to build Fort Duquesne. It requires a, you know, it requires a cultural exchange. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. And hopefully what I leave you with is to show in the context of commerce and the fur trade on the Great Lakes, where uh, native people, French people, and British people all bring something to this mix but yet, the way it's delivered isn't always the way it's received in, in all three parts. And uh, so we're going to talk about, uh, give good examples of this in, in the fur trade. So to start off a little bit, we'll, we'll talk some, we'll discuss a little bit about sort of the basics of the fur trade here. And, uh, and, and the fur trade is dependent on water routes to the interior of North America. And really, there's only three ways to sort of get to the interior of North America um, in the 18th century in water routes. Now, one isn't on this map. Above this map would be Hudson Bay, which you can approach by ship via this, you know, the North Atlantic Ocean. But the, the, the two routes we're going to focus on are the, the water routes, which depend on a canoe, really. So you can take your ship up to about Montreal and the St. Lawrence River coming through this way. But once you get there, uh, you, you're limited to using a canoe to be able to access the interior of North America. One route being the Ottawa River route, which takes you to uh, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan area. You know, what we associate in the 18th century as Michelin Mackinac, Mackinac Island, or St. Ignace when the French built a post. And then the other route is uh, continuing down the St. Lawrence River into Lake Ontario, and where you come to the west end of Lake Ontario, which is where Fort Niagara is situated. Uh, through the Niagara River, and then you can access the lower Great Lakes, Lake Erie, and then eventually over to Detroit, and then down the river system into the interior of North America. So the fur trade requires ability to transport goods on water to the interior and then back out. And then, you know, when we talk about North America, we can't separate it from the big picture. And the big picture is this is just one piece of a global economy. And we'll be hitting on that as we go through this talk, but when, when we're talking about the goods and the fur trade, these are manufactured in Europe, of course, and these same, same goods that we see in North America also show up in, in Africa and in India, other places throughout the world. This is, so, so the North American trade is, is a, it's a, it's a portion of, of what's sort of a lar larger growing global commercial enterprise. And of course, this is uh, the product line, right? The beaver and the deer are the big sort of product. So the, there's an angry beaver and a deer chew in your garden, so you don't mind taking his skin off him, right? Because he's destroying your garden anyways. But the beaver, you know, the beaver pelt, of course, is used uh, in, in manufacturing fur hats in Europe. And the, and the deer is something we off, you know, it doesn't get sort of as much Attention is the beaver pelt, but the deer trade, deer skin trade is significant. And what that's used for, I'll show you in a second here, is for making what's the more or less the, the car hearts of the 18th century and deer skin breeches. Very, very um, significant commerce in making deer skin breeches. And so, more so places like Fort Pitt and down in the Carolinas, you're seeing 
thousands and thousands and thousands of deer skins being uh, shipped to transfer to, uh, to Europe for making these breeches. And then, of course, there's our fur hat from the beaver. And in the other direction is the trade goods. And you can see a nice photograph that's from Grand Portage in Minnesota. Um, an example of the kind of goods, you know, you have your keg of powder, you have a lot of textiles, you have some uh, kettles, things like that. So the, the, the furs, skins go, go to Europe and then the European countries send these goods back in exchange. Um, but here's an example. So when things are shipped, as I said, it, when things are shipped to the interior of North America, what you really have in places like Niagara um, and Detroit are, they're, they're, they're not so much the place in the 18th century where native people come with their pack of furs to make the direct exchange. It still happens, but on a very small scale. By the, by the mid-18th century French and Indian War, that type of thing is actually happening in as far west as like Manitoba. You know, that's, that's the prime fur country, that's where the exchange is typically taking place. But this side of the frontier uh, we're talking more about trans transportation points, you know, where, where you can bring a small ship to Niagara across Lake Ontario, but when you get there, you have to take the cargo out of the ship, you have to repackage it, you have to carry it across the Niagara Portage, put it in a canoe, and then carry on, during the French period particularly. So what we see is, is these goods are actually repackaged in what's called bales, and we can learn a lot about what's being exchanged by looking at the contents of these trade bales. So here's a manifest, actually a 18th century manifest of uh, trade goods, and you can see we have six bales of strouds and six bales of moltens and, and bath coating. Now these are all textiles, and that is actually probably the biggest dollar item in the fur trade is textiles. So, so these are the inventories, you know, where somebody at for instance, at Niagara has unloaded this ship, repackaged all these goods into bales, and, and prepared them from going to the interior. And, and, but, and here's a price list, actually, from 1739 in Niagara. So you can see that, you know, the expectations of what would be received for some of these items. You can see vermilion on there, which is the, the powder that native used to make uh, paint to apply to their faces is, is their custom. And you can see that they're expecting to receive, um, this is in French, but they're expecting to receive uh, five pieces of chats. Now, French, that means cat, but back then it's probably a, a raccoon skin. So there's expectations of, of what they want to receive, and that's a good example. And similarly, these trade goods are not just for the commerce. As I said, alongside the trade is diplomacy. So here's a list from the French and Indian War uh, from a British post, Fort Cumberland, in 1755. And so these trade goods, you know, they're, they're native people, you know, like to receive these, these goods and in order to foster these alliances that both the French and the British required to prosecute the war, they need to cultivate these alliances. So this is an example where the British will give this list of goods, and it's the same kind of goods that you see that would be exchanged for furs other places, but in this situation, they're actually giving these things as gifts. And part of what that, you know, the, it can be characterized as, uh, as bribery, I suppose, but I think that would be an in, inaccurate uh, assessment. So a when you read, you know, the speeches and the, and the presentations in diplomacy, you find language like, you know, referring to each other as brother and as father, okay? Both the French and the British and, and native people are using this language. And, and um, I think when we're talking about diplomacy, it's not some, so much a, an effort to sort of bribe allies, but it's an expression of generosity that you find is, is a primary piece of native culture in the 18th century. If you're a father or a brother or a family member, you're expected to be generous. And I think that's, that's actually the sort of the true root of where you see a lot of the gift giving in, in the di diplomatic efforts. But here's those bales that I was talking about. That's actually what they look like. And so you can see two 18th century French images here. One is uh, Joseph Vernet in 1754, that's the port of Marseille, and you can see a French dock worker 
taking his coffee break on uh, strategically placed bales. And then on the bottom, you can see their arrival in North America. And this is a 1730s-ish image of uh, Native American people transporting these bales over probably a portage, much like what the Niagara portage would have been, or some of the portages, for instance, to get uh, through French Creek or from Presque Isle. Uh, you know, you're going to have several portages before you actually end up at Fort Duquesne. So this is a probably a scene that could have occurred, you know, in a place like this, just transporting these bales over a portage. And that, again, inside the bales are the, are the goods. So all this requires a good delivery system. You know, what good would Amazon be if you could order online, but you, you know, you couldn't, they couldn't deliver the goods? So this is the Native American piece. The, one of the major uh, contributions they made to the fur trade is the delivery system, the transportation, and that is the birch bark canoe. And there, this is a neat little image from the Canadian Canoe Museum in Peterborough, which showed, gives you an idea of uh, you know, the kinds of goods, the, the way goods were shipped and packaged, and, and what uh, one of the, the large trade canoes would have been expected to carry. And this is probably something representative from like the early 19th century, later after the French and Indian War. But, but that's a great, great representation of, you know, you get the idea of the scale of the canoe and the volume that they could carry, probably 5,000 pounds or so. So let's talk about these uh, canoes. Great quote right from the beginning of, you know, the French presence in North America several of whom came to our vessel with their canoes, which are from eight to ten paces long, keep that in mind, and about a pace or pace and a half broad in the middle, growing narrower towards the two ends. They are very apt to turn over in case one does not understand managing them, and are made from birch bark, strengthened on the inside by little ribs of white cedar, very neatly arranged. They are so light that a man can easily carry one. And there's Samuel de Champlain describing a birch bark canoe. So what I want to focus on or draw your attention to is that eight or nine paces long and about a pace and a half broad. So when you do all the conversion from the 18th century or 17th century, in this case, French measurements, what that comes out to is about 17 feet long and about two and a half feet wide. So just think about that size uh, John Buxton, the artist, was kind enough to bring a fabulous example of a birch bark canoe um, uh, uh, built, I don't know, what, probably 20, 25, 30 years ago, perhaps. But So that one's about, I think, 13, 12 feet long? Okay. So, so just so imagine, you know, a canoe, you know, a couple feet longer on either side. But, I, you know, I hope you all have a chance to come up later and, and look at it because it's actually a a, a treat to see a, a birch bark canoe up close. Um, but keep that in mind. So the canoe in the Native American context at this point is, is about that size. Very, you know, there's a couple references to larger size canoes, but if they are, it's only really meant for carrying people on a war party. They're not transporting huge amounts of goods. <clears throat> but we, we can see, again, we have other, dis, you know, we can see sort of what early 18th century, 17th century canoes look like by some of the records, actually, that Native people left behind, um, which are, again, kind of a rare example. So here, this is a petroglyph, and you can see the canoe with eight figures in it. And, and eight figures means eight places which means there's eight places for people to sit in there. <coughs> and that's about the largest you see Native American built canoes uh, built in the, in the 17th century. Now this is on uh, Agawa Rock near Thunder Bay, Ontario, and it still exists. This is probably about a 400 year old painted petroglyph. And then notice the figure underneath, this serpent figure. Keep, keep that in mind for later on too. And then here's another, now this is a different kind of petroglyph. This is actually scratched into stone. And this is on, from the Maritimes. This is at Kejimakumik National Park in Nova Scotia. And I've actually been there and seen this, and it's very, barely, barely visible anymore. 
But there's a, uh, what I would call a Micmac style canoe with a little different shape to the stern and bow and the, and the, the gunnel section. But again, you can see it's, it's clearly the scale is meant to represent a canoe that two people could sit in. And then again, check out the, the serpent there, keep that in mind. So from these, you know, East Native American records, you know, again, something apart even from, you know, a description left by the French or the British, we can get sort of an idea of what their canoes look like. And then there's plenty of European records left too. So this is the, uh, from the Codex Canadensis uh, images by Louis Nicholas, I think, yes. And so this is about 1700, and he was a Jesuit priest, and he operated in the uh, Mississippi Valley of North America. And you can see his depiction of the native canoe. And again, definitely with the scale, although I wouldn't recommend standing in a canoe that size at all. But uh, the scale is clearly meant for just transporting a couple people. And another 18th century French um, image on a map that's part of a map cartouche. Don't have the date on it, but the um, it's it's right it, it's in the ballpark of late 17th century, early 18th century. But again, you can see the actually you can see two methods of portaging the canoe: two people carrying it with the uh, the canoe up, and then another person using a thwart in the middle to carry it on their shoulders down. So again, referencing what Samuel D. Champlain said: one man can carry a canoe. And then, really, really nice other 18th century European depictions of canoes are the many, 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 many um, canoe models that were made in, in this case, this one was made in uh, Nouvelle France, uh, late 17th century. This is at the Museum of Fine Arts in Chartres, France. Um, so the canoe model, including figures, and you can see um, five figures in this one, it could probably, you know, have a place for six figures, but, you know, this is great because it has the sail, and, uh, and then you can see their paddles, and, and, you know, if you're interested in the clothing and material culture, you know, you can see depictions of that, and this is great because what do we have? These are things that we just saw in those fur trade bales, you know, cloth, you know, that one fellow's wearing a wool match coat that's probably like the, the molten type cloth that we saw mentioned on the the uh, <coughs> inventory from the trade bales. And then here's another, another depiction of that same canoe model um, from another angle, and you can see the intricate detail. Now these were made uh, as more or less souvenirs in New France. You know, visitors from France could purchase one of these and collect them as a sort of a memento of their visit to, uh, to what then Canada. Um, so let's, again, see the scale, see a little bit of the construction technology. And then we have a couple 18th century actual plans. Now this one is in the British Maritime Museum, and it is 1750. <coughs> and, uh, and this uh, fella, and we, we don't know who actually drew it, but he actually measured you know, an, an 18th century canoe in North America, and he puts the length at 18 feet. So again, it's very similar to what we heard Champlain describe, you know, 120 years earlier than this. And there's one more British elevation of a canoe right here. What I like about, I wanted to show this one to you, is you can see the, the panel on the bottom of the canoe there, you know, to uh, assist with people not, you know, punching a hole through the, the bottom of the birch bark, through the the ribbing and the sheathing, and also sitting on that ribbing is not always the most comfortable thing. So that's, that's an interesting feature you don't often see in one of these um, images is, is the, uh, the panel on the bottom. Really different kind of paddle designs too. Unfortunately, we, we could probably talk, or I could anyways, about <laughs> paddles all day long. Um, but that's something, again, that's rarely seen is a real clear depiction of paddles. But again, so it's similar, it's, it's consistent with what we've seen. These Native American made canoes are, you know, generally speaking, no more than about 18 feet long. The purpose is transporting families, maybe a little bit of goods, but nothing on a large scale. 
Now here is our last little sort of look at a 18th century canoe. And this actually is, this actually is an 18th century canoe. This is, this is a canoe that was collected by, uh, I believe at the time he was Lieutenant John Ennis. And he, he was in North America during the Revolutionary War and a few years after. And this canoe is, is, at this point, it's at his estate in Cornwall, in England. And so that is the remains of an actual 18th century canoe. Uh, now it is in the Canadian Canoe Museum in Peterborough. And, uh, you know, it's not on display, but you can speak with Jeremy Ward, the curator there, and, and come and have a look at it. And actually see an 18th century canoe. And so... Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the, um, you know, the, the French sort of taking on, you know, recognizing the significance of the native design transportation device, the canoe, and then adapting it in, to meet the needs in their cultural context. In their cultural context, it's about commerce. It's about moving a lot of material, making the fur trade as efficient as possible. So the French actually instead of relying on native people to build canoes and then acquiring them by a trade, you know, the French established canoe yards. And the, the best known canoe yard in Nouveau France was the Le Maitre family. And so Louis Franquet visited there in 1752, just of course before the French Indian War breaks out. And if you can't read that in the back, it says, he's, um, he's describing Trois Riviers, and, and he says, in this city, where they make the best bark canoes. I have been to see a canoe yard. They were building an eight place one. It was 33 feet long, five wide, two and a half feet deep, and cost 300 livres. The craftsman who makes them didn't want, did not want to divulge his secret. That is the way he determines the curvature of the two ends. And then he says, women and girls work on them. They are wholly made of birch bark with rounded ribs that are used in place of knees. They are of cedar or pine wood, two lignes thick at most, and three pouces wide. And the seams covered with pine gum are watertight, but one must be aware of rocks. And that's a good advice in a birch bark canoe, okay, unless you feel like stopping and, and melting pitch. But, so now what do we see here? So the canoe has become a commercial device. They're making them 33 feet long now, almost double what we saw was sort of the the, the common size when it was in the Native American context. Now it's in the French, European, commercial context that we are talking about. And, and we can see immediately they're getting much, much larger. Why? Because we have to handle all those bales of trade goods. And there's another shot of that Ennis canoe. And so we're going to, now, now keep in mind, we're getting canoes bigger and bigger. And I want to show you some of the, you know, from, from this, this original canoe, some of the construction devices and just think about the skill, the ability required to, to build one of these things on that scale. And by the way, the Le Maitre family, they probably had some French craftsmen, but I believe they were more or less hiring some of the local Iroquois people that had settled around Montreal and above uh, in the Seven Nations. And uh, you know, th there's evidence that they're actually hiring Native Americans now to build canoes, which the French will then use in a trade context to deliver goods to other Native Americans. So you can see where this mixture of cultures is, is happening in places like this. And they're, you know, where French are providing, you know, work and in order to carry on this, this commercial enterprise to Native American customers in the interior. And so here's a good shot of the Ennis canoe. And you can see when, um, Franquette was talking about the ribs and the sh cedar sheathing. So the, the cedar sheathing is below the ribs, and that's very, very, very thin strips of cedar. Cedar splits very, very easily. White cedar, that's clear at least, does. And then similarly, the ribs are of, usually of white cedar, and you can see where they fit in here, and they're, they, they tuck up under the gunnels of the canoe, which, which run along the, uh, the top edge of the bark, sewn into place with spruce root. And um, so you can see uh, that's a lot of work. All those ribs are steam bent. They're split down from cedar trees. 
They have to be steam bent to fit in that canoe and then everything lashed together with split spruce root. And again, here's a, there's a conser, uh, conservationist from Cornwall working on the Ennis canoe. And he, this is a good shot of that, what I just said, that spruce root used to lash the gunnels to the bark. And then these are the gunnels, these round uh, pieces of usually, again, cedar or possibly ash tree. Uh, but that spruce root, now you're going to probably pull up, I would say in a canoe that size, you're, you're going to pull up maybe 30 yards, maybe more of spruce root. You're going to have to wet it, straighten it, split it, smooth it out before it can be used to sew the canoe together. And again, imagine that on the scale of something 33 feet long. And there's a really nice close-up shot of the, of the ribs. You can see this one even has a knot in it, which makes it a little bit more difficult to work, but they managed to do it anyways. And then see how thin that split cedar sheathing is too. Just amazing amount of work and skill. And then, so this is a great little uh, research project that Timothy Kent, who's written quite a bit about the fur trade in canoes, he lives in Michigan, he came up with this. So he examined, I don't know, probably 100 or so fur trade uh, permits issued by uh, the French government in uh, the mid 18th century and back into the early 17th century. And this is a great visual um, chart to show you exactly what I'm talking about. It was how, as the fur trade becomes more prominent, the canoe changes. It's no longer the same as it was strictly in the Native American context. Now that we're in this European commercial context, it's different. So we can see when we get this, this, is, this represents the number of places in the canoe, or more or less how many people will, will fit in it. And you can see late 17th century, as we progress right up to 1752, these canoes are being built to accommodate uh, more places, which means a larger canoe. So when we're talking seven or eight places, there we're talking like about a 36-foot canoe or so. So in 17... 30s and 40s, we're even experimenting with, you know, one canoe somebody built, which is probably about 40 feet long at this point. So we go from those classic 16 to 18 foot canoes all the way up to 36 foot canoes is, is, the, is the common size now. And again, so the canoe, when the French received this Native American designed technology, the canoe is a delivery system for the fur trade, it changes to meet their needs. It's, it's no longer about transporting families, it's about transporting cargo. And there is a very rare specimen. So that is actually probably the last existing freight canoe. Um, this canoe, well, it, Edward VII, who in 1860, 1860 would have been Prince Edward of England, he did a North American tour yeah, again, in 1860, where they, they took a canoe ride down the St. Lawrence River. So these canoes were built in preparation for his visit. And that's about a 40-foot canoe. And so there's even images and paintings of, of Prince Edward enjoying this trip, being paddled by Haudenosaunee paddlers. Um, so this was probably built, you know, 1858, whatever, a couple years before his visit. This canoe and this picture is actually from the late 1960s on the shores of Lake Erie. This canoe eventually in the early 20th century was acquired by the Buffalo Canoe Club based in Buffalo, New York, right up the 79 and 90. And, and uh, the, the uh, founder of the Canadian Canoe Museum was asking them consistently in, in the 60s to sell him that canoe so he could preserve it. And they said, no, we, we just want to keep it. Until, I think it was 1969, the Buffalo Canoe Club had a fire and that canoe went up in flames in that. So, so this, this, again, the last surviving probably freight canoe that, that we're aware of was still around up until the late 1960s. Like I said, the Buffalo Canoe Club, even it's called the Buffalo Canoe Club, and on Lake Erie, was actually in Canada. So, don't blame Buffalo. <laughs> 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 so
So now we're going to talk a little bit about the French. Uh, I pick, what I did is I just picked a couple items that are, I think are sort of iconic from the French and the British side. We'll talk about those a little bit. And then the same thing about how, you know, when they're delivered to North America and they, they arrive in this cultural mix, you know, where people have different priorities and different understandings than perhaps was intended. So this is the Biscayne Axe. And this, this example was actually found um, right on the shores of Lake Ontario, probably 15 miles from Fort Niagara. A friend of mine owns that, and I had hoped he would be here and bring it, <laughs> but it didn't happen. But that's, uh, so that's probably a late 17th century French trade axe right there, the Biscayne Axe. And um, Biscayne Axe comes from the Bay of Biscay, so this, this bay between France and Spain, and this particularly this section right here is where we see all these forges that are producing these iron tools. There's, uh, you know, there's rich deposits of iron in those mountains in there. And this is one of those forges that's still standing today, although obviously not operational, but um, this is in northern Spain, and this is a forge in that Bay of Biscay area that would have been producing these axes in 17th and 18th century that, that ended up everywhere, all over North America and, and other continents too. And then you can see sort of some images of their introduction into North America. This is a Basque fisherman in Newfoundland in the, actually the uh, 16th century. Hard to see, but you, they're using these Biscayne axes to actually um, cut up this whale and, you know, they'll render fat from the whale, um, but they're using these axes to, to cut through the thick hide. And there's a couple other images of these Biscayne axes. Again, this, this uh, 1730s-ish image from the Beinecke collection in um, Yale University. One of these fellas right here has a, a Biscayne axe in his belt. So you can see them being introduced and used. And then this one, one of the more infamous uses of Biscayne axes, uh, Father Brebeuf, very famous uh, Jesuit missionary, uh, founded uh, what the, the mission site of uh, St. Marie among the Huron, which is, uh, you know, they have a recreated site there in uh, Midland, Ontario, great place to visit. But Brebeuf was martyred there among, uh, with some other Jesuits, and there's actually a martyr shrine there to Jesuit, um, those Jesuit martyrs. But uh, Brebeuf was infamously, uh, it was described that they placed a red-hot ring of axe heads around his neck as a method of torture when they, uh, when they killed him. And there's a, you know, there was no eyewitness, uh, of course, there, but uh, <laughs> there's a depiction of what somebody understood happened to Brebeuf, and and the infamous role in this case for the axes. And then here's some uh, actual, you know, we just spoke about Brebeuf and St. Maria among the Huron, and these are some axes that they've actually dug there, very well preserved for, you know, 300 years in the ground. There's one here, you can see that distinctive shape which we, uh, we saw through all those images, and I'll draw just, you may not be able to see it very well, but I'll just draw your attention to these touch marks. And there, it's a circle, you know, uh, intersected by, by two lines, sort of north and south and east and west. And that's a, that's a touch mark that we see almost everywhere in the Great Lakes. And, and the touch marks sort of represent different manufacturers and can represent different destinations, but that's our sort of our Great Lakes touch mark. And then same at St. Marie, you can see all these other axe heads, you know, that they found in, in, in good condition. So you can, you know, if that's what they found after hundreds of years in the ground at that site, you can imagine how many actually were delivered to that post. And another an original one, this one has a Western New York connection uh, found in um, Canandaigua area where uh, close to where there was many, many significant Seneca villages. And again, you can see that touch mark there. And by the way, you can still buy these. If you really wanted to own one of these, they're so plentiful. They're, they run maybe $175, $200 to buy an original one off of eBay or whatever. Um, 
This one is actually, it's, I, I just had to throw this in because it, it makes me laugh, but this is at the City of Niagara Falls Museum in Niagara Falls, Ontario. And, and, and this is, was on a display of, of early Niagara Falls history. You can see those three touch marks right there. This was labeled as like Uncle Joe Patterson's axe found in his shed or something like that. that, that they, they had it on display as sort of, you know, a, a well-known local guy. This was the axe he used. And I'm looking at that, and I'm like, do you know that's <laughs> probably a 300-year-old axe? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that they did. But. And uh, this, this is an interesting one. This is in the Rochester Museum and Science Center. And so you can see how it's manufactured by where it's broken. You know, there's a weld right there on the eye. So unlike a lot of axes from the period which have sort of a split cutting edge where there's a steel bit inserted, these are actually all iron. And they're just welded right on that side seam. And, uh, but you can see this one didn't last. And, and it's funny because there's, you know, I, I actually brought a couple of reproduction Biscayne axes with me made by a, uh, an accomplished blacksmith in Maine. And, and I know somebody else that had one of his axes too, which actually broke in the very same place as this one. So, you know, it just shows you, I guess, when your product breaks the same way as the original ones, I guess in one way you're doing something right, but maybe <laughs> we'd prefer it not to break. <laughs> and um, there's that touch mark, again, hard to see, but you can, maybe in this one, you can see where there's that little bit of light colored rust right in those sections. Again, that's, that's Great Lakes. That would have been down French Creek into the, you know, Allegheny River as well. Now there's some digs that have been going on in um, Ontario and they frequently come up with these axes. This, this is from a uh, Ontario Archaeological Society journal on a dig in and around Midland, Ontario, Collingwood, Ontario, where these, the, you know, these posts, uh, these missionary posts were, were often set up. And so you can see they're finding these axe heads in varying um, conditions, but I like to just draw your attention to the one in the top left corner. You can see on the face of it, there is a, uh, a line sort of across the middle, and then you can see on the side view, that line is, you know, there's, there's material that's been taken out of that axe head, and, and the others are in good condition, more or less, you know, a flattened eye that's sort of to be expected. Somebody's pounding something with it, but why would, why would somebody try to cut that axe head apart in that manner, in that location. And so that's one of those things where you ask yourself that question and it's, you know, there's the possibility to sort of uh, get into some, you know, the frame of mind of the, the customers who receive these axes. And this is, this is again, what we're talking about here is, is the French make this axe, you know, as a, a trade implement. You know, it's obviously useful as a tool, but sometimes it's received a little differently depending on the cultural context that you know the Native American people receive it in. So what, what somebody has done there is they've actually taken, and, and in the best guess is they've taken some cordage and just Im embedded it with sand or gritty material and just very, very methodically and slowly sort of use that as a saw to try to break that ax or, or cut off chunks of that ax. So why would somebody do that? And this is not an isolated example. This is, this, these kind of axe fragments show up other places. So here's one of those examples. This, is, this isn't the, the actual fragment that was found in a, uh, I think it was a Wendat village in what's now Toronto. It was featured on a documentary called The Curse of the Axe, which is, you know, it's, it's online in various places. I recommend you watch it. It's actually, my old archaeological professor is featured on it too, so um, it's a lot of fun. So this fragment, again, was found in this uh, Huron village, and they, they, the touch mark on this was different than our usual circle uh, Great Lakes touch mark, and they, had, they actually were able to trace the touch mark back to the very forge that this axe was uh, made at in Spain. And again, the question, why would somebody cut this axe head up into a fragment like that. What they figure is that the trade network in North America was so extensive that probably some native people from the Maritimes, 
you know, went into one of those Basque fishing stations when they were all, you know, the Basque fishermen were gone, found a broken axe and proceeded to break it up into more pieces and via the North American trade networks it ended up in this village in uh, what's now Toronto, hundreds of miles away, much earlier than, you know, from when the, the fur trade hit that particular village. Um, it's a mystery. I mean, you know, if you, I, I enjoy watching shows in archaeology, you know, Time Team in, in England and so on, and when they come up with one of these questions, often the answer is, we don't know, it must have been some kind of ritual or a, a, a religious reason or a spiritual reason that we just don't understand. I, I think that's possible, I, I can't argue with it, but I think there's also another possible interpretation. What did I, you remember what I said earlier about the families uh, in the native context, there's an expectation of generosity. When you receive something you know, new or wonderful or you know, some kind of really wonderful benefit, you're, there's an expectation to share, okay? And so I think what we may have here is, you know, this could have been the first instance of steel or iron, you know, showing up in a Native American context, a, a material completely foreign to them at that point, never seen before. And, and you, I think it's possible there's an expectation that you share that, which means you got to find a way to break it up into smaller pieces so you can hand it out to other families. And so I think that could be what's going on here. And, and one reason I say that is because we have other great references from the fur trade where, you know, the first time wool blankets are showing up in, you know, northern, northern Great Lakes area, or the first time that brass kettles or copper kettles are showing up in the northern Great Lakes, French missionaries and French traders say, you know, they're in, with a little frustration that the native customers actually rip up the blankets into small pieces so everybody in the village can have enough to, for, uh, to have a piece for themselves, or the kettles are broken up into smaller pieces to hand out to numerous people. And then often we find those kettle scraps are made into jewelry or bracelets or, you know, earrings, things like that. So, I, 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 you know, there's simply not enough in information to say for sure one way or the other. Could be ritual, I suppose. But I think it also could be just, this is something brand new, something, you know, the French have delivered to us, which we've never seen before. And, you know, like I said, in the French, the intention was an axe to use as a tool, but in this case, maybe it's received as a, uh, you know, something that's so unusual, we just can't help sharing it with each other, even if it means taking it apart into smaller pieces. Okay. All right, so we'll, we'll get to the next piece here. The, the, the English, sort of the iconic... Um, English item that we're going to talk about is this trade gun and uh, it's a flintlock fusee and again I have a pretty good reproduction of an English trade gun up here for you to look at and um, but we're gonna we're gonna move on through so we can get to uh, the details here but there's a that's just a good example of a you know this is called a commercial hunting fowler trade gun whatever you know there's no like European or native aisle and trading posts. Everybody buys each other's goods on, in these frontier posts. Um, but th their English trade guns are known for being made primarily in Birmingham. And there's, a, there's an image of Birmingham in the 18th century. And, and there's actually like a gun manufacturing alley in Birmingham, which is, you know, an, sort of an industrial complex. And, and, and it's not so much that, you know, one guy makes the whole gun. You know, Wilson is a very well-known uh, maker of flintlock uh, trade guns. But Wilson, think of him as a contractor who's hiring a bunch of subcontractors to make the parts. And then Wilson, you know, he's in charge of assembling everything and then selling them. But, but trade guns have proof marks to show that their, their barrels are substantial enough to withstand the powder charge. And these are the, these are the proof marks that we would see in the, in the 18th century. And then here's an example of an English trade gun with those proof marks on the barrel. So you know it's been tested, it's, it's known to be safe. And um, this is a well-known mid-18th century trade gun that, so this is representative of what the English 
you know, may have used in their diplomatic efforts or distributing to native people as gifts in the French and Indian War. This is called the, this gun is made by John Bumford. Again, he's really the, the contractor. In fact, by the time this gun was built, he was probably deceased and his wife was actually the contractor. But you can see some of the architectural features of this gun. And this gun is, is on display in the DeWitt Wallace Museum in Colonial Williamsburg. But again, the flintlock, but you know, one common feature in the English trade gun is that very, very slender wrist uh, right here subject to breaking depending on the grain of the wood, but a very lightweight gun. That gun only weighs five and a half pounds with a 48 inch barrel. So again, this gun, now what I wanna talk about for the rest of this uh, discussion on the English tray gun is that serpent side plate. So the origin of the serpent side plate is probably something inspired by Asian design. I would guess, you know, there's question about whether it's a serpent or a dragon. They're usually described as serpents though. And that ends up being sort of, you know, the, the, the known common feature of an English trade gun is that serpent side plate. And so here's another example from a Wilson made gun in a private collection. You can see that flat brass serpent side plate. You can see the, the larger trigger loop compared to what you would see on the muskets of the day. There, there's less substantials. So they're, they're not going to be robust like a military arm. They're lightweight, and that's what the native customers wanted. They did not want a heavy gun that shot a large bullet. They wanted a lightweight gun that shot a smaller bullet because it uses less powder. And you can see some of the, again, this is a mid-18th century Wilson gun, but you can see that flat butt plate with, that's nailed on. You know, most of the military guns of the period are going to have a butt plate that's screwed on. So again, it's quick, easy to make. It's, it's all about efficiency in producing these guns, as many as possible, to get them to the customers in North America. Now, this is actually, so, so pieces of these guns have been dug up all over North America. You know, like from South Carolina to Northern Canada, out west to, you know, Alberta, Wyoming, and so on. Because they stayed in production for over 100 years. These, you know, varying different types, but more or less the same uh, pattern of English trade gun. This, these pieces here, and you can see the serpent side plate right there, that's in the Rochester Museum, and that's a piece that was found in the Genesee Valley in uh, the mid uh, 18th century. It's hard to date that exactly, but what I want to draw your attention to is the missing head. You can see the snake's tail, but his head is not there. And again, that's something like the cut up ax heads that is not, it, it's found somewhat regularly. So again, we have to ask ourselves, why are we finding so many of these serpent side plates with a head missing? And you can see this is a, again, an English trade gun with a complete side plate. This is a survivor gun, you know, that stayed in good shape. And these are pieces found in an archeological context in Northern Ontario. Head, you know, two different types of, uh, side plates, but both of them, in this case, the head is separated from the body. And here's an example of an, a surviving trade gun, but again, the head is missing. There's no head on that side plate. And even, even just kind of cruising the internet uh, last week, preparing, I even found a guy on a, on a uh, you know, like a treasure hunter website, and he's like, well, look what I found, you know, this, this weird looking snake head. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know if, um, he does say it's, he found a piece of a side plate. So that's, this is interesting, because this is a side plate off of a French gun, very clearly. That, I believe, is a, another French gun. So it would have been earlier 18th century, but in the same place, he finds this head off of a, an English trade gun side plate, whether he, he knew it or not. And, and again, archeological, Ash Rapids is up in north of uh, Lake Superior. And here, again, they find sort of two different, um, you know, the, the flat one in the middle is earlier 18th century, and the one on top is sort of later 18th century, but again, both of them missing the head. So again, we ask ourselves, like the axe head, why? 
And I think we can find a clue here. Remember how I pointed out where you saw the canoes accompanied by those snake serpent depictions. So when we're talking in the Native American context, you know, we have to appreciate their, their spiritual uh, understanding and their, their religious uh, understanding. So again, we see a canoe in context with a couple snakes and then that horned figure above. And again, this is petroglyphs in Northern Ontario on Lake Superior. So in, what this is depicting is it's, it's the horned or the underwater panther, which is the horned figure. And then he's in native beliefs, he's often accompanied by these horned serpents, okay? And what does our serpent side plate sort of look like? Sort of looks like one of these horned serpents. So in the Native uh, American, particularly Anishinaabe, you know, late, uh, Upper Great Lakes people, believe that horned serpent has some influence on your hunting success, whether or not you're going to be successful in your hunt. And I think what we can take from this is, you know, there's, it, if we find that, you know, this horned uh, serpent is affecting your hunting and maybe you have a bad day or, or, or maybe you figure he has too much influence on your hunting success, you take that side plate off your gun and you break his power. You break his head off that side plate. And uh, then put it back on because you do need it to keep your lock in your gun. But you, if you take that head off, you kill that, that serpent and perhaps you kill his influence on whether or not you'll be successful in the hunt. I, I don't, you know, you, you'd have to ask somebody back then, really, if, if that's all the details. But we see, again, we see this so often and we understand that at least that much about the belief system. I think, I think it's an interesting conclusion that you could draw or at least a, you know, a assertion for the reason for it. And, um, and again, I think it's a good example of how these English goods are introduced, but when they hit this cultural mix, sometimes the result is not what's expected. Sometimes there, things are changed a little bit because this cultural mix is, you know, it's, it's uh, different sources of information, different sources of belief, different sources of you know, there's different ways these things are being received. You know, from the beginning with the canoe as a delivery system to these French axes and the understanding to need to be generous when you receive a benefit. And then these English trade goods, when they, this gun sort of meets, you know, and its depiction of a serpent meets the native belief system, which, which features a serpent. So that's my take on it. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any at this point. And then I'll, I'll just, you know, if there's enough time, I do invite you to come up and have a look at the, the reproduction goods, if you like, particularly the canoe. As I said, it's not often you get to see a birch bark canoe up and personal. But any questions at all? The underwater panther was taken from a real animal, or is it all mythology? And you know, I, I, I guess I would say it's mythology. You know, he's... The, it, it's, it, you know, at the risk of sort of delving into, you know, their belief system, you know, and I, I, I hesitate even to say what I do say because it's, it's theirs and um, I don't have full understanding about it. But the underwater panther is typically at odds with a thunderbird. So the thunderbird is in the sky, the underwater panther is below the water. And, and so, again, you, you, you see a lot of depictions of thunderbirds on native, uh, you know, uh, pouches and, and um, quill, in quill work designs, things like that, yeah. What I'm getting at is there's so many different types of art that is an animal with a long tail. Right. Could it be an otter? Could it, it, did, it, did it come from something? Or yeah. is it all mythology? I, I, I don't know. I, I would say it's more, more likely more mythology. And I, and, and I only say that because I know some present-day Ishinabic people and they do, you know, line sketches and paintings of, you know, the the horn, uh, the underwater panther and horned serpent, and and in their mind, at least, the underwater panther is depicted as something that is mythological. It's like a dragon, you know, with with cat features, things like that. So I, they're probably the best ones to ask, you know, in the sense that it's their, in this case, you know, maybe oral history, 
And, but but I get, that's kind of my best guess is from understanding how they depict it nowadays is, is more or less a mythological creature rather than, you know, a, a creature that existed in the forest at the time. Another question. Would, you know, some of the symbols that they painted on the new bow or whatever? Yeah. Would, I, would, yeah. would they on the one of Oh, or? yeah. Would, I, I have not seen that. I, I'd say... The, the you know the artistic depictions of canoes are generally sort of geometric line designs, more so than actual depictions of creatures or or objects. And and I take that only from you know the the canoe models that are around. You know there's many canoe models around, and uh, I off the top of my head I can't think of any with a sort of a painted you know creature or or anything other than a geometric design. But if somebody knows the one, I'd be glad to have a look at it. Yeah. Oh, all right. Craig <laughs> <coughs> uh, did a canoe that is in Paris. Yep. Was that a native production or was that French or were they able to tell? It's, it's, I, I would say I don't know that you could tell conclusively. I would, th this, is, this is much, and we don't know exactly how Ennis acquired it, but there's this very, very tantalizing piece of his journal, and he kept a pretty good journal where he says when they're coming down the St. Lawrence River in 1777, um, they overtake two Frenchmen in a canoe and, uh, and then like sort of stop them and bring them and their canoe on board, you know, to sort of get the latest intelligence of what the American disposition is outside um, Montreal and Quebec City. So it's interesting to think that, well, maybe it's that canoe, but I, I don't think so because after the war, he is still in North America. He actually leaves to return to England, but then comes back, and he's in North America again until about 1788. And, um, and it's said that his officers sort of, um, he, he enjoyed fishing, and uh, you know, there's some descriptions of him fishing in canoes, things like that. And, and probably the case is that you know, he either acquired that canoe or somebody gave it to him as a gift prior to his last departure from North America, sort of in recollection of those fishing trips that he made in those canoes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the upper Great Lakes, particularly in the freight canoes, had very tall sweeping bows. That's, um, again, that's kind of a feature of um, probably the like Ojibwe, Chippewa, you know, other Anishinaabek people manufacturing canoes. You know, it's in that, that's like a whole study in itself is looking at the different hull shapes, different configurations and in, in canoes made by native people like that, that uh, pictograph of the, the Mi'kmaq canoe in Nova Scotia was considerably different. And their, their canoes are made for, you know, traversing um, small sections of ocean. You know, to get, for instance, from like, you know, like Maine to Nova Scotia or from Nova Scotia to Prince Edward Island, things like that. They're actually known to be taking their canoes across big water. So they're, they're you know, so I think that's why you see sort of the tall uh, gunnel section on their canoes is, uh, is, is make the, that kind of transit a little bit easier. Yeah. I suppose it's, it's possible. I think, I, I just, I'm reluctant to say we can definitively look at, you know, a, a native piece of, uh, you know, art or, or native made technology, things like that, and, and clearly delineate or define, you know, a tribal origin. I, 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 even then, these shapes of canoes, like, you know, besides the Mi'kmaq with that distinctive shape of canoe in the Maritimes, I mean, there's also, um, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy people, all making the same kinds of canoes. So you have different, you know, sort of different tribes in that case, different nations making similar designs. You know, this, this canoe is very similar to that Ennis canoe in the shape of the bow and the stern. And that probably came from the upper St. Lawrence River. But again, there's many, many different native nations up and down the St. Lawrence River, including, as we learned, you know, French people making canoes too. So it, it I, 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 w I don't know that that would be a definitive sort of exercise in the 18th century defining, you know, who's coming down the river by the, what their canoe looks like. 
Although I will say there's a re good reference to somebody who observed what they knew were Frenchmen coming down a river of canoes, or river in a canoe, because they could see a massive cloud of smoke. <laughs> so that means the French guys were all smoking their pipes as good French guys would, right? Anything else? All right, thank you for your attention.